Hi there, I'm Philip Heitzen, the founder of Art of Procurement. And at Art of Procurement, we help procurement professionals like you plan and deliver change with confidence. Whether it's through the mapping and prioritization of your change journey, securing the subject matter expertise that you need to help you along the way, or assisting you and your team to take action on what they learn and what's really important is on also what they already know. And of course, a big part of what we do is this weekly podcast where we share strategies and tactics that aim to inspire and help elevate your change journey. I want to thank you for joining me today. Let's go straight into the show. Hi there, and welcome to episode 236 of The Art of Procurement, and I'm joined today by Joanna Martinez. Joanna is founder of Supply Chain Advisors and author of the new book, A Guide to Positive Disruption, How to Thrive and Make an Impact in the Churn of Today's Corporate World. Now, Joanna is hardly new to Art of Procurement. In fact, we'll actually be speaking on stage together at the upcoming ProcureCon Indirect East event, reprising a similar keynote that we actually gave last year at ProcureCon Indirect West. And I really love working with Joanna. She's also appeared on the podcast a couple of times before, all the way back in episode 59 and 66, when we were talking about value-based procurement and um, you know, thinking about expanding the procurement value proposition. Between those two conversations and the one that you're going to hear today, there's no denying that Joanna's vision for procurement extends far beyond the tactical methods and measurements. And so in this interview, we actually discuss the difference between change and disruption. We look at the simple ways that you can make a positive difference and actually face the fact that each and every one of us has to learn to embrace the churn. Now, I started this conversation by asking Joanna, as I often do, did procurement find her or did Joanna find procurement? Like many of the answers you've probably gotten, Philip, procurement found me. I am an engineer, Mm -hmm. and I was in line to be the next plant manager for a consumer products company's flagship manufacturing facility. And that was my goal. Most of the jobs I had had were, were preparing me for that. There was a reorganization. Uh, I didn't get that job, and I was offered a chance to go into procurement because one of the few people who survived the reorganization was the head of procurement who was beloved at the company. Mm -hmm. He wanted to move in to mergers and acquisitions. He didn't have a replacement, and I was offered the opportunity to come in and learn under him. Uh, with an understanding that it would be years, that it wasn't going to be fast, that I wasn't just going to go from where I was to to leading the group, but that that was a path for me if I was willing to give it a shot. So, boy, it was tough. Mm -hmm. It was tough to make that decision when you had something so tangible in front of you and then suddenly be years away from that promotion, but but I decided to give it a shot. How long then did it take for you to get that promotion from starting in procurement? A little less than three years, okay. two and a half, yeah. And I, I did every role in procurement from MRO, transportation, you know, office supply, sort of you mm-hmm. know, worked my way up. So what did you do about getting a grounding in procurement then when you came into the function, you know, having come in from really not having any understanding of what procurement was? Well, I actually had learned a bit because I had run third-party manufacturing okay. for a bit. Mm-hmm. So without realizing it, yeah. I had acquired a few skills. Uh, the company was very generous in terms of their willingness to train. Mm-hmm. And I had a fabulous mentor. He made an extraordinary difference. And I wasn't afraid to go to my peers or the – I didn't report directly to him at first. You know, I reported to somebody else. Yeah. And um, I wasn't afraid to go in and say – I don't understand this, or how does this work, mm-hmm. and, and that sort of thing. I want to just touch on, you said about having a great mentor and what a difference that made. Is that something that you pursued? Like, did you look for a mentor, or is it something that just happened a little bit more organically? Well, you know, so I move into procurement, and here is this CPO who, quite honestly, is dying to get out, mm-hmm. right? He is, it was brilliant, he was funny, he was an outstanding negotiator, he had all of the skills, but he was anxious for the next big role, yeah. which he saw for himself would be moving into M&A. Yeah. So I, I was fortunate to get assigned to this group and to have someone who was so uh, interested 
in me being successful. Mm-hmm. So I think that was important. My success was going to allow for his success. Right. So I think that was great. Uh, and and uh, you know, few of my mentors achieved the kind of success that he did. And I think for all of us, you need some time in your life to have somebody who really makes it, right? Mm-hmm. It's If you have a mentor and that person never achieves what their goals are, that in a way is going to limit you yeah. in terms of what they can teach you or the kinds of exposure that they have. Yeah, and I get, I guess yeah. the inspiration as well. So if you're yeah. seeing somebody else achieve their goals, their dreams and ambitions, then it gives you a little bit more confidence that you have the ability to do the same in your career. That he taught me something very interesting. One of the first negotiations I was on, he prep, was prepping me. And he said, you know, everyone here thinks that I'm a tiger who goes in and rips people to shreds. Mm -hmm. I'm really successful. I know I'm really good at this. But there's no reason to do that. That you still have to have a relationship afterwards. There's no reason to be mean, even if you've got all the leverage. And I was working for a very big name company. Everybody wanted to be our supplier. So even if we didn't have high volume, our name was significant leverage. And he said it has nothing to do with that. There is no reason on earth for you not to be respectful, kind, considerate, and things Mm -hmm. like that. And he said there are there are lots of mechanical academic ways to think through negotiation problems there's lots of places to get yeah. training uh with if you prepare you go in fine and you don't need to be banging on tables yeah. and scaring people yeah and don't abuse the power that you have because you had a lot of power in those negotiations just by the nature of who you were right right in fact i'll share the story that he had an office that overlooked a uh, pond Mm -hmm. and Canadian geese would settle in for the winter and that was a problem because they would chase the employees if the employees (laughs) were too close to the desk. And so uh, the company had a border collie who would go and kind of chase the geese from from the walkways and things. And he had a a dog bone, a plastic dog bone, that when you pressed it, it barked. <laughs> and he hid it in the office. And if he was in a really tense negotiation, he would hit the button mm-hmm. and make make a dog bark sound. And everybody would stop and go, where's that dog? And it would immediately sort of diffuse yeah. the tension. And everybody would be looking out the windows to see yeah. Duncan the Border Collie. Yeah, so it's yeah. All, all about creating a safe space, I exactly. guess. Yeah. Exactly. Um, you know, as you progress through your career, are there any fundamental perspectives or beliefs, you know, from a philosophical perspective that you really tried to take to each role that you did? Well, certainly the, the be, I tell people be kind. I think Mm -hmm. I should be telling them be respectful. I think that's perhaps a better, uh, a better thing there. You know, someone who works for you today may be your boss's boss tomorrow, the way things move and the way companies consolidate and things. So I think that certainly has been a fundamental uh, foundation for what I've tried to do. Mm-hmm. The other thing, though, is that the change is inevitable, right? Yeah. Someone showed me early on in my career, uh, I, was man- I was managing this group of people, and one of them showed me a list that he was keeping of all the bosses he had had. And when I looked at the list, I realized that he had more than a boss a year. I mean, yeah. it was it was the turnover was not even a twelve month turnover, and I started to realize the churn that was going on. That somehow I had been a little bit oblivious to. Mm-hmm. You know, I was I was junior enough that it, and, and nothing had touched me yet that I just didn't realize, uh, you know, how much happened out there. And I started to recognize that I had to prepare for the churn. That in mm-hmm. fact, if this many people had turned over that quickly, I recognized that it meant that this job that I had just taken, I probably wasn't going to be right. in that long. So maybe I had to be thinking about what I was going to do and what, what forces there, there might be. Yeah. And then you're not, it's an interesting kind of challenge that we all have, isn't it? You go into a role wanting to, um, to think about the long term and to have the biggest lasting impact that you can have in a position, yet in the knowledge that you may only be around a year and so, um, you know, until you go and move on to something else. And so that can create some short term thinking. I wonder if there's any ways that you were able to balance like doing things for the long term um, while knowing that perhaps you're not going to be able to be around to see them through because you're going to be in another role. Well, 
if the long term is a mile away, let's say, uh, if you can advance a couple hundred feet mm -hmm. in a short period of time, well, at least you've done something yeah. to get closer to that end goal. Yeah. So I think that that's, that's the way you have to look at it. Yeah, because I would always struggle with the, you know, especially within procurement where savings are so obviously important as we've all gone through our career of being judged on the savings. So getting short-term savings when you know that's not the best long-term decision for the business. Um, and there's always a... Uh, a temptation to do that and think, well, the next guy is going to figure that out because I'm only in this role for a year or two. And I think that's a real problem that we have in procurement is that we're driving that short-term thinking because you go on to the next category. Um, you know, as you rotate, if you're a generalist at least, you're going to rotate through a variety of different categories. So you only stay around in a role long enough to get you know, a year or so of savings um, and then you move on to the next thing and it's not necessarily clear that those decisions were short-term until you've moved on to the next thing. And I think that really is a challenge. You look at the office supplies category, for example, right? Every time office supplies gets redone in a company, every time there's a, um, you know, a new event or a yeah. new contract that comes in, and, and I'm putting this in quotes, the company saves a million dollars, and it's the same million dollars that comes up <laughs> right. over and over again. This person does it, you do it, I yep. do it, you know, et cetera. So it, it is important to not just focus on the savings. Now, I get it that people are in roles and their bosses are telling them, I want to see X, Y, Z. Yeah. And you certainly have to follow what your company is instructing you to do as long as it's legal and ethical. But you also need to be thinking about the other ways you make contributions and including that in the conversation. Mm -hmm. you, you can, to some extent, control the conversation that goes on. Yeah. So instead of saying, oh, I saved you know, $5 million on that, it's, oh, I saved $5 million, and look at this cash flow analysis I just did, and if we change this with our payment methods, or if we look at this piece of technology, we can do X, Y, Z. Mm -hmm. So you can start to take that conversation and make it broader, yeah. or I was able to avoid a problem yeah. because I read this contract and realized that we were two weeks within our notice period for a renewal yeah. and it was not a contract the company mm -hmm. was was preparing to so you need to if you're filling in blanks on a uh, on a spreadsheet yep. that you've been given a template you've been given to say here's my contribution you have to figure out a way to make that template bigger even if it's a matter of putting a second sheet yep. in or putting a couple of asterisks or something in red that says here are the other things yeah, even if it's not a hard measure at least yeah. it's it's showing other ways that you've created value and right. we're, so we're, we're sitting here actually at ProcureCon uh, in Direct West and I think the first panel of the first morning there was a discussion around um, the fact that savings are never going to go away but um, it's about like what you were saying talking about the other va areas of value the other things that you've created of value um, and that you will be measured on those just not in a numbers way but you're going to be measured by your clients or your stakeholders or whatever it is in that way as much as the, the number that you report so you're reporting your number to finance but the people who you're really working with on helping them be better at what they do in their business they will value these other measures more than anything that you may be reporting up to finance and that's the measure of them continuing to want to work with you and that's really important, Philip, because there is value in getting alignment with the business and getting people in the business who have your back. Mm -hmm. So that, the, say you work for the CFO, nothing like having the CFO go to an executive committee meeting and have the head of sales or the head of marketing or, or the head of manufacturing say, hey, you know, this was, your people helped me do this, yeah. or thank you for allowing so-and-so to work on this project because it helped me do this sale faster, better, yeah. or, or whatever. And you might not be able to capture that on a quantitative measurement, mm -hmm. but you can't discount those qualitatives. Yeah. If your boss is hearing enough from his or her peers, there is going to be value in yeah. that. No, I've always throughout my career had the opinion that, um, you know, you can always be fired for saving more money than you, your target, but by upsetting everybody in the process. 
but it's very unlikely that you'll be fired if you miss your savings target. But every single executive across the company is an advocate for what you're doing for them because those are the ones that you're providing a service to. I know it's not as black and white as that, but that's always a philosophy that I've tried to take in that, yes, yeah, savings might take care of themselves, themselves, but I'm not going to go in and focus on that. I'm going to focus on helping them. And if I do miss my target, then hopefully I've got some advocates in the business who are going to be happy with how I've supported them, and then they'll speak up for me. Totally right. Um, going back to kind of your career journey, is there anything that you look back on now that you wish that you knew at the beginning of your career that you now know? Well, I wish I had paid more attention to the other aspects of the business mm -hmm. because the reality is it is all about how much you sell, right? It's about you know what, what's your revenue and the expenses come second, but you need to have the revenue before you yeah. are, are worried about the expenses, right? Or not have the revenue and yeah. then you worry about the expenses. But it's all about growth and, and, yeah. and making more. Most and companies don't cut their way to success totally, totally. or growth. So I would have spent more time aligning, learning, maybe even trying to do a stint in the sales and the marketing parts of the business. Mm -hmm. I think that would have been very beneficial. Now, you talked a little bit um, earlier about change and, you know, the constant of change. And I know that it's something you're really passionate about and that kind of ties into disruption. Um, I want to talk more about disruption. It's something that you've written a book about that I'm going to include in the show notes um, for our listeners who want to check out a little bit more at the end. But I want to be clear about definition. You know, what does disruption actually mean to you? Well, well... For me, let me let me define positive disruption, yeah. right? There there is for disruption, Clayton Christensen, who's a Harvard professor, has done a the classic definition of disruption. He talks about businesses focusing on uh, fewer and fewer clients. That a business comes out, they've got a bunch of products, they've got a bunch of clients over time. People start to concentrate on a few and and even create more products and more emphasis when the folks, those clients may not actually need it or yeah. want it, uh, and sort of ignore the less profitable segments. And I think a good example is uh, the hotel, the overnight stay industry, where the large hotel chains started to concentrate more on the more profitable business traveler, mm -hmm. while there was this whole segment of the vacation family budget travelers not being really serviced until suddenly Airbnb comes yeah. and starts to take a significant segment of that and then starts to chip away at the base as well. Yeah. Right? So when people talk about disruption, they talk about reading about disruption, often that's what they're talking mm -hmm. about. To me, positive disruption or disruption in a business, within a business, not outside, is a uh, change that you feel, change that you came in on Friday and you did this, and on Monday you came in and you did something different mm -hmm. because something fundamentally had changed. If someone does a computer upgrade over the weekend and processing in the background takes less time than it used to, that's not a disruption to me because you don't see or feel anything yeah. different. But to the extent that a new technology comes in, processes change, and, 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 and uh, things go away or get done differently, and your job is fundamentally different, mm -hmm. that to me is disruption. And I think there are lots of negative disruptions out there in the business world, right? You, you have reorganizations, your boss gets whacked over the weekend, yeah. you know, somebody new comes in, somebody buys your company, all kinds of things that affect you in some, in some way that you can perceive as, as negative or you have a period of time where you're worried it's going to be negative. Positive disruption is you know, something that changes for the better. Maybe yeah. it is a reorganization that yeah. in the end you wind up with a, with a better role. And I think there is an extent to which we can create positive disruption for ourselves, right? You can't control negative things that might happen to you where uh, the business goes away, changes, sales drop, mm -hmm. whatever, competitor comes in. But you can control positive changes that you make at work. And you've got two reasons to do that. One is that you're getting a paycheck, yep. right? You are getting paid. The bills are getting paid. You know, you and the family have a place to live. There's food on the table because someone has employed you. And I think you have an obligation to your employer to do your best. Mm -hmm. And if you see things that aren't right, 
you go to make those changes. The other reason is, with so much churn and so much disruption in terms of who I work for and when and who my boss is and who owns the company, uh, you will likely multiple times be in a situation where you're being evaluated, right? Maybe there's a reorganization, there's two people for every job in the new company and there's some assessment going on. Or maybe you don't get chosen because your company is just totally being assimilated, you know, into the new business. And uh, you're going to be out looking for a job. You need a way to set yourself apart. You need to use positive disruption and the things you do to make things more positive at your firm to be a foundation for you when you go to look for another job Mm -hmm. to be able to differentiate Mm -hmm. yourself from the other candidates. So am I being too simplistic in thinking that essentially uh, from a personal level, the difference between a positive disruption and a negative disruption is mostly down to our own mindset? Yes, I would say mostly. Not 100% because, because no matter how happy you are, if suddenly the paycheck's not coming, there's yeah. a little you know, negative in there that you're going to have to figure yeah. out. But, but yeah, you are right. You, you are right. Um, so, so as you think about challenging or, or approaching a disruption, and um, you know, I talk a lot in, on the Art of Procurement about courage, and then I kind of evolved my thinking into a lot of courage comes from confidence, you know, confidence in the ability to do things differently or to see that other people have been on this journey before and succeeded rather than have a negative impact. Um, how have you been able to kind of find the confidence during your career to look at a disruption and, and kind of take the positive, handle it in a positive way, um, in a way that you can take advantage of that disruption as opposed to it taking advantage of you? I spent a year, uh, maybe five years into my career, when at the end of the year I went to write my accomplishments against my goals, and I realized I had done pretty much nothing, mm-hmm. that I had spent the entire year being worried about the effects of an impending change. And I allowed that to consume me. And I was horribly embarrassed when I looked at what I was supposed to have done over the year, realized I had 12 months to do it, and I had barely made any headway on on anything. So I spent a lot of time thinking, how do I make sure this never happens? Mm -hmm. Now, some people might change careers, And certainly, there are places where the disruption is happening at a slower pace than others. So you certainly could make a change and and push it off. Although I don't think there's anything that isn't being disrupted in some way. So you can kind of you can kind of make that disruption curve, you know, a lot a lot longer. Uh, And there were a couple of things that I did, and I write write uh, in the book about it as what I call a personal toolkit. Mm -hmm. So you need to think about, what am I going to do? What am I going to do if this job goes away? And it's different for everybody. Some people have a a spouse who's employed who makes lots of money, and it's not not an issue. You know, some people... um, you know, might choose to really make sure that they keep their debt down, yep. right? So you can take whatever savings. You know, there's yep. millions you of flexibility. books. Yes, and mm-hmm. there's lots of things. You have to come up with the plan that's best for you. I uh, spoke to college students, and I said, ask mom and dad not to make your bedroom into a Pilates studio mm-hmm. quite yet. <laughs> why, don't you, why don't you just save yourself that option yep. of being able to go back home if – Things go awry. You start your new job. You're so excited. You're right yeah. out of school, and suddenly uh, you know, your company gets purchased, yeah. and we're is moving someplace in the world that you don't want to move to. Yeah. So, um, so for me, that was important. And I think today there's this perception, right, that millennials are are so flexible and they don't care and they can go anywhere. And you know what? Perhaps that is true to some extent. However, over time. You wind up with a significant other who perhaps is in a role. You know, perhaps they're a teacher, or perhaps mm-hmm. they're a physician. They're in a role where they're not as mobile. They're not yeah, as they're interested anchored. in making a move. Yep. You have kids in school. You have yep. things like that. So sooner or later, you get into a situation where um, 
the odds are that a disruption uh, outside of your control could be a little bit more negative than mm-hmm. it is at the very beginning of mm-hmm. your career. So I think you need to to do that. The other two things I think you need to do is really keep those skills up. You know, I had someone in who was looking for a job in technology, and I asked him what you know, tell me about some interesting things. He was coming to me to network. He knew I knew a lot of people. How, I, how could I help him? Tell, and I said, tell me a story about something that you did that was really impactful. And he proceeds to tell me a story about the day that the first PC was brought into the office mm-hmm. that, that he worked at. And I don't even know how many, 40 years, <laughs> I don't know how many years ago would right. that have been? And, and that was the best, that was the best thing he could think of. Yeah. That's a problem, yeah. right? That's someone who is not going to come across well as an interview because they don't have things that are, are, um, are new and relevant. different and edgy and relevant yeah. and things. And you need to really keep up on that. And the last piece is... You can start from ground zero, starting, but it will take you longer, right? So when there is some disruption happening, uh, to the extent that you have prepared yourself by making sure that your LinkedIn profile is mm-hmm. up to date, that you're commenting, that you are adding to your network, uh, people of all levels and in all fields and things like that, because you never know where that, that next referral yeah. or idea is going to come from. You need to be building that a piece at a time because you will be impeded if you ha- are nowhere on yeah. that. And you need to do, so I'm such a big believer of building your personal brand. You know, I always felt that when I was as a practitioner as well, there'll be things that I would do throughout my work that um, people would know that it came from me, even if it was presented by a manager, for example, because I wanted, again, to have a brand around the way that I spoke or the language that I used in a uh, presentation or the imagery that I used, everything that is so, that creates the business of you, essentially. Um, And the time to do that is when you're not feeling any pressure. You know, the moment that you actually find yourself needing to go and get a job, then you're already behind. So doing it when you actually feel like you least need to do it is probably the best time to go and do it. Absolutely. And it can sound like a lot, but if you take it in really small increments, you, you, I'm on the subway in New York and you see everyone's on their phones, everybody's doing something. Yep. Well, if you're reading an article mm-hmm. that is about some new technology or new idea or new way of doing things. If you are um, listening to a pod, you know, listening to art of procurement, yep. if you're in the procurement space, right? Listen to a podcast. And if it takes you a week to get through it because you only have a few minutes at a time, that's okay. Mm-hmm. All of us somewhere have a couple of minutes, even if it is utilizing that transportation time or utilizing 15 minutes to reach out to a former colleague, you know, to just ping them and say, thinking of you, what's up, and kind of rekindling that that old relationship, yeah. right? It doesn't have to be, okay, I need eight hours a week uh-huh. to do this. You have to look at it as a whole bunch of little five-minute increments. Yeah, and that's why I'm such a big proponent of the idea of micro-learning, you know, why we're building some of the things that we're building um, on the active procurement side is because we have, it's really hard to make the time to invest big chunks of time in doing things like that but there's small things that you can do all the time that compound on each other and if it's just going and like you said going on LinkedIn and just answering a few questions that somebody may have posed as a LinkedIn message or something just things like that starts to get you known and gets your name out people become familiar with you know your photo or whatever it is it's better than doing nothing Um, and it just kind of builds on it uh, over time yes you're totally right Uh, my book is a little under 150 pages, Mm -hmm. and it's that way on purpose. In the process of creating it and talking to authors, I learned that the trend is to reading in shorter spurts and reading you know, less. In fact, one woman talked about a book club that boycotts books that are <laughs> the larger than 250 pages. Uh-huh. And um, she said that really limits what we can do when it comes to, you know, a, a big novel. What we're going to showcase. Yes, right? exactly. <laughs> but uh, so I tried to create something that was almost sound bites where you could pick it up and mm-hmm. on a commute 
read a chapter and yeah. then put it away or on an airplane get through most of it that that kind yeah. of thing yeah. now i know my attention span is so much shorter that um you know you have all the best intentions but then if something seems like it's uh too big to even start with you never even start yeah. because it just is overwhelming yeah. so we've talked a little bit about the I would say the emotional side of being a disruptor and preparing yourself, getting the foundation in place to give you some confidence um, to um, approach disruption in a positive manner. Is there a technical side of being a disruptor? There is. And I, I call that your professional toolkit, mm -hmm. right? So you do the things you need to get as close to peace of mind as you can. So you can kind of park that then, right? Yeah. You don't have to worry about it anymore or spend time being consumed about it. So then, okay, I'm, I'm working now. I want to make change. I want to be the one who's got something different to tell a, a future employer. Uh, so there are a bunch of things that, that, that you can do. One is, first of all, that you don't have to be the smartest person, the one who thinks on their feet mm -hmm. the fastest. If you are well prepared for your meetings, for example, if you research, if you have an idea and you research it thoroughly and you think about the questions people are likely to ask you and you make sure you know enough to be able to answer those questions and not give the famous uh, response, oh, I'll get back to you, yep. right? Uh, you can get really far with your ideas, right? The better prepared you are, the better, the better, uh, uh, you know, way you can convey, you know, what, what you want to do. The other thing is you need to understand yourself and you need to understand the characters that you're working with, right? Mm -hmm. So I am a, uh, kind of a shy person and, uh, struggle sometimes when it comes to, uh, speaking in front of a large audience of people. Yeah. Now, so I, therefore, I sign myself up to go to conferences and speak in front of people right. because I can practice. And if I, at a conference, I stumble or I forget what I was going to say, well, you know what? It's okay. It's not the end of the world. And I, therefore, maybe practice some techniques or some ways of getting around that. So when I'm trying to convince my boss or my boss's boss or I'm in a big meeting, I will have more confidence yeah. because I have had you know bigger practice yeah. with that kind of thing. No, it's it's funny you say that. I do exactly the same. So I, I feel like for me the podcast is. I really like the podcast medium because I'm still able to do that, um, not in front of a crowd, if you will. Um, and I'm still uncomfortable going and standing up in front of rooms. Like yesterday, we, we both did a presentation together in front of a fairly big room. And that's really intimidating for me. And I feel the only way to get better is to practice. But it's so hard. <laughs> There's so much stress involved in putting yourself in that situation. I feel like every time I do it, I'm thinking, why the heck did I sign up for this again when I'm not comfortable doing it? But then hoping that every single time I get a little bit better. Yes, and for those folks listening to the podcast, Philip and I gave a presentation together at a conference and uh, had the experience of suddenly our slides not, <laughs> right not being queued up right at the beginning. And so we had to kind of jump to Q&A and actually got five-star ratings. So I'm happy oh, about I, that. I didn't yes. check it. I'm always afraid to go and look and <laughs> yeah, check at what ratings are. But, uh, but yeah, we, that was some, a place where we were, I think, prepared because mm -hmm. we had rehearsed we didn't anticipate that that would be the issue but yeah. we had certainly planned ahead of time what our agenda would be and how we would handle it yeah. so we were able to to cope with that and probably something we couldn't have done if we if it was the first time we'd both stood up on stage probably because i'd have just been like a rabbit in the headlights yeah <laughs> yeah uh so the other thing though you kind of understand yourself and and um you know, how you operate best, then you've got to look at the people at work you have to influence as everyone has a different style. So your CFO likely is going to be the numbers person, right? Mm -hmm. And so you don't go into them with an idea, without, a, without some sense of what's it going to cost, how long is it going to take, how yeah. many people are going to have to work on it, et cetera. Uh, he or she will not be interested in something that is a feel-good uh, kind of experience for people in, in, in the company. Likely, they, they, they will not be interested in that without some tangible benefit mm -hmm. being outlined. Similarly, there are other people that you work with who might be more um, 
people oriented and therefore yeah. more open, those are the ones you might approach first. Yeah. You have to think about that. I had a quote from Winston Churchill. I have a quote from Winston Churchill in the book. And it says, when you're 20, you worry a lot about what people think of you. When you're 40, you don't worry what people think about you anymore. And when you're 60, you realize nobody was thinking about you in the first place. <laughs> yeah. And I think there is truth in that. We all think about ourselves, right? You think about yourself and how am I going to react and what am I going to do and how is this affecting me? You have to take your head and wrap it around. How am I impacting this other person that I want to change their opinions or get them to agree to do something. You've got to kind of put yourself in, in their mindset. And I think that's something that we don't really do mm -hmm. naturally. Uh, I think it's also a good idea to read a little bit about negotiation and master some basic negotiating techniques, yeah. you know, or, um, or at least be cognizant of some negotiating techniques. You don't have to go to a big negotiating course, but all of us, every one of us negotiates to some extent, whether you're, you know, a college student and you want your curfew mm -hmm. changed, you know, whether you are a new employee and you want, um, a, you want to negotiate a salary, a starting salary. You know, millions of us do that, whether we call it negotiation yeah. or not. Every single interaction, well, not every single one, but so many of the interactions that we have in negotiations. And I think about it with ourselves as well how often we don't again realize it but we're negotiating with ourselves all day every day right because we're talking ourselves into or out of doing certain things and to me that's just like an internal kind of dialogue of a negotiation you know i never thought of that i think <laughs> you're really that's really true that's really true so then the the then you so you, then you've got that right you've got a sense for the people you've got a sense for the how and then you need to get a sense for the what. What do I want to change? And there you just keep your eyes open. Mm -hmm. You look outside your industry. You talk to people. Yeah. Even if it's at a party, you talk to a friend who is in some totally different line of work and you might come up with some idea to bring back to your company. Yeah. And um, there's, if you're in a company that's very well established, maybe you talk to somebody you know at a brand new company because yeah. they are likely facing different issues. I think all issues turn up at all companies at yeah. one point or another, but the cycle's a little bit different. Yeah. And uh, so you might be able to get an idea from there. Yeah. Yeah, I, I feel that all when, so many ideas aren't new ideas. They're just new contexts. Mm -hmm. You know, you you're bringing them to a new environment. Like a lot of the things that we try and do in terms of what we're doing with data procurement, it's stuff that people in other verticals do. You know, sales within the sales environment, within a marketing environment, which gives you the confidence to know that there's a likelihood they're going to work because they're working for other people in other environments. Um, and like you say, just looking, looking beyond the walls of what your job is, what your company is, what even our industry is, you'll find things that could be applied that just haven't been applied to us yet. Right. You, know, you look for things at work, a report that you pull together that nobody ever asks you a question about. Mm -hmm. Well, probably at some point in time, that report was a good idea. I mean, companies, people in companies and companies themselves make good decisions. Yeah for the time, but because of churn and because of the, perhaps the original decision maker being gone and a new person being in, sometimes things continue to be done long before or long after yeah. they cease to be needed. And that's another thing to look at. You know, one very simple situation is someone I worked with who realized that uh, FedEx was going back and forth between our company and a an important supplier, uh, we were both in Midtown Manhattan, mm -hmm. not that many blocks apart from each other, and probably 40% of our employees passed their right. office on the way to uh, and from to work every day. Or yeah, exactly, yeah. exactly. It wasn't even a, su a subway wide, it was kind of a walk. Yeah. And made that cost go away, yeah. right? And it saved a bunch for the people who were handling all of this volume going back and forth. It saved some money and, and, you know, she just automated it. And, and, you know, it was just one of those things that was so ingrained. Nobody stepped back mm -hmm. to say, does this make sense anymore? Why are we doing this? Yeah. So I know that we're about time to wrap up uh, with our conversation today. As we finish, uh, is there anything that you'd like to leave, you know, that kind of summarizes 
uh, your philosophy within the book about positive disruption and, and, and its importance and embracing it. Becoming a disruptor is important. It's important for your company, and it's important for you as an individual. There will be times in your career where you'll be faced with being one of a number of people being considered for a role, a promotion, you know, whatever it is. And you need to figure out a way to stand out from the crowd. Mm -hmm. And being a positive disruptor and having some tangible examples of ways that you brought positive change to your company is going to make you stand out from the other other resumes and the other people. I tell people all the time, embrace the churn. It's going to happen, so you may as well embrace it and understand that it's going to be there. And for me following the steps that I have in the book are what helped me embrace yeah. the chair. Well, John, I want to thank you so much for sharing your experiences, your thoughts around the idea of positive disruption. It is something that um, I'm really passionate about too. I think that as procurement professionals, it's our job to enable positive disruption, to challenge the status quo. Uh, but it's often something that I've seen so many times that we fear and let it consume us. So um, just... My final question, it's always the easy one that I say, is that if listeners would like to find out more, um, if they would like to get their hands on a copy of the book, where would be a good place for them to go? Well, the book, A Guide to Positive Disruption, is on Amazon mm-hmm. in paperback and in Kindle. And also look for me on LinkedIn. Yeah. Yeah, Joanna Martinez. Okay. Yeah. Well, what I'll do is I'll include the links to Amazon uh, for the book, and I'll also include a link to your LinkedIn profile in the show notes. Thank for you. For today's episode, and that's going to be at artofprocurement.com slash positive disruption, or one word. That's artofprocurement.com slash positive disruption. So, Joanna, thank you very much for joining me. Thank you, Philip. Hi there. I want to thank you for tuning in to today's podcast. You can check out all of our back catalog at artofprocurement.com slash podcast where you can also subscribe to our newsletter to make sure that you never miss an episode. And if you found value in today's show, I'd love if you would tell a peer, or perhaps go and rate and review by going to artofprocurement.com slash review. Word of mouth really is the best way to help the podcast grow, and if you're able to do either one of those things, I would truly appreciate it.